Corinthians 9 again tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. You know, the microphone might be working just fine. It might just be that I can hear myself, and that's what sounds so terrible. <laughs> you ever hear yourself and the way you actually sound compared to how you sound or you think you sound? Uh, it's miserable, actually. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And there's a lot to glean, actually, here tonight. Uh, at the outset, I'll just warn you that you're going to think, well, if I'm not a preacher, if I'm not uh, being supported by the ministry or by, the, by preaching of the gospel, then this passage of Scripture is more about how I should treat or how I should think about others. Well, that, that aspect is truth, but there's more to it than that, actually. There is, tonight in this passage of Scripture, a mindset about an eternal crown. And so I want us to understand that tonight... And if you want a title for the message tonight, it would just be simply Preaching for a Reward. Preaching for a Reward. So look down to verse 14 with me and understand that the context does not begin in verse 14, but we did cover up to about there that last week. And we're going to just read on down a ways. Uh, and actually, I want to read just to verse 19 tonight. Uh, Paul says this to the church at Corinth, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I've used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me, if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward, but if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily that, when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. I want to read verse 19 one more time, and then want to go to chapter 9 and verse 1 to kind of tie in our context, and then we'll pray for the Lord to help us. In verse 19, For though I be free from all men, Yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Now, verse 1 of chapter 9. Am I not an apostle? Am I not, what's that next word? Free. Free. Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are, ye, are not ye my work in the Lord? So, Father, I pray that you would help us tonight to understand how to be ministers of the gospel for a reward in a way that would please you, we ask in Jesus' precious name, Amen. Well, I'll be honest with you. This is a this is a passage of the Scripture. I think that a lot of times that evangelists preach uh, pretty frequently, or guest speakers, guest preachers will come into a church and they'll preach a lot of times because it's not a comfortable message, honestly, for a pastor to preach or for someone who is uh, supported by the ministry or by the church to preach. Uh, simply because, you know, it's, it's not a very comfortable thing unless you have a lot of pride or unless you're angry at somebody about something uh, to toot your own horn or to promote your own self. And that would seem to be Paul's, Paul's position here as he preaches uh, or as he writes this first part of chapter 9. Of course, he didn't write it in that chapter, but he writes this portion of the letter to the church at Corinth. It would seem as though Paul is saying, I have the right... Uh, to receive the support that I received from you, and actually it isn't so. Actually, we see at the end of our text that Paul is saying, I have the right to be supported by the ministry, but I have, I have uh, laid aside my right. I have given up my right. Now, I've uh, heard a lot of people that just are frustrated or angry or bitter against uh, the preacher being supported by the ministry or by preaching. And uh, I've, I've met quite a few folks about it. There's a guy who's a Facebook friend. I, I don't know who he is, honestly, but he's on Facebook. And uh, just about every week he rants about churches and how that they should take all their money and all their facilities and they should sell everything and they should give it to the, to the homeless. And that preachers uh, should not get paid and that they should 
um, you know, that they they're just all in it for the money and that no preacher should get paid at all. And you can give them the scripture, show them what the scripture says. Now, are there abuses in in quote the ministry? Could we say that charlatans are nothing but charlatans? I, you know, I appreciate when the scripture says that the person who uh, rules well is worthy of a double portion. And I appreciate that rules well portion because if a pastor doesn't do a good job, he'll just be fired. I, you know, you hear me saying it. I, I believe it. I think that if a man uh, isn't a hard worker or it is, doesn't work hard, and uh, then he isn't worth. Uh, supporting or paying. This is a passage of Scripture that's just dealing with some nuts and bolts issues. And by the way, how would we know what God thinks about how a church should function financially and whether or not a preacher ought to be paid or ought to support himself if the Scripture never mentioned? Aren't you glad the Scripture does mention some things that are, that are just practical but also just give us some principles and guidelines to go by? And I appreciate this passage of Scripture and everything that it means. And I appreciate the Apostle Paul's spirit. So as we go through it this evening, those are just some things I wanted to mention to you uh, just to, for the approach of our mindset. But do you know what the Bible says about how it is that a church ought to take care of its servants? The word minister means servants. How should a church take care of its servants, those who serve in the church? And so... Uh, let's just go ahead and look at verse 14. And again, I, I titled the message tonight, Preaching for a Reward. And this is what Paul is, is boiling it down to. He's coming out without any kind of qualification or without any kind of... Um, he's not, not holding back anything. He's not ashamed to say so. He's saying, I'm preaching for a reward. I'm preaching in order to be rewarded. At the outset, you and I would say, What? Really? That's what the ministry is all about for you? But actually, when you see what Paul defines as the reward he's preaching for, you'll see that the reward is not monetary. It's a reward at the judgment seat of Christ that he's preaching for. And so let's look at it this evening. And, and by the way, let me ask you a question. Is anyone here hoping for a reward? Anyone here want a reward? When you stand before God, you want God to say, you know what, everything in your life was a waste. Or you want God to say, well done, here's a reward. I want to please the Lord. A reward means approval, approbation from God Himself. I want that, don't you? And so I will say to you this evening, if you want your life to have purpose, there's something to be cleaned here from all of us. How many of us are to be servants? How many of us don't want to be great? I'm not talking about the world. You know, a lot of people in the world want to be acknowledged by other people. But you know, the Bible teaches that we ought to strive for greatness. We ought to strive for the mastery. And greatness is not you recognizing me. Greatness is I achieve God's purpose in my life and God recognizes it. And every one of us ought to want that. If God made you for a purpose, could you be any more fulfilled or satisfied than to achieve that purpose to your utmost? Not possible. I mean, this, this really is what we ought to live for. This is what gives us our focus and our attention. And so now let's, let's just go ahead and just look at a few things that Paul, first of all, says he is not working for. In verse 15, uh, he, he has already explained that he has a right to expect to be supported by that which he has participated in generating. Just like an ox has the right to uh, partake in the corn that he treads out, uh, the person who sows a vineyard has a right to expect to eat of the vineyard. A person who ministers and sows spiritual things has a right to expect to partake of the physical things. And he used the illustration as well of the Levites in the temple. They served in the temple. They didn't have financial support, and so they were supposed to be supported because of the servant, spiritual service that they did for other people. Okay, now I'm not trying to bore you this evening. Let's go to verse 15. Paul said, but I have used none of these things. Okay, so he's defended his right, but right away he qualifies by saying, I have not, I have not uh, exercised my right. And then he goes on to say, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. So now here Paul is clarifying, he's saying, I'm not saying, listen to me now, church at Corinth, I'm not writing this to you so that you will support me financially. It's not my point. 
And he goes on to further say, uh, that it be so done unto me, for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory in void. <laughs> Paul said, you're not going to put a dollar on my service unto the Lord. Y'all ever had somebody insult you by trying to pay you before? You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever, ever done something for someone and then had them try to pay you? And what they tried to pay you was an insult? I have. Uh, don't take this the wrong way, but uh, I don't work for cheap. Now, I work for free a lot of times, but I don't work for cheap. If you were to hire me at, for an hourly wage, you know what I'd ask? Melissa, what would I ask if you wanted to hire me for, by the hour? What do you think? You take a guess. 50 bucks an hour. No, you're wrong. What do you think, Mrs. Price? If you wanted to pay, for, pay me hourly, what would I charge? At least 10. At least 10, she says. At least 10 times 50. Yeah, that'd be about right. <laughs> I'm a 100 bucks an hour guy. You want to hire me by the hour, I'm going to get 100 bucks an hour. You say, seriously, Pastor? Yeah, nobody ever hires me. <laughs> but to be honest with you, um, I, I'm beyond, I passed in life uh, doing things for a paycheck and expecting to be paid minimum wage. You want to hire me for minimum wage, uh, I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to work for minimum wage unless there's nothing else and I have to work for that or something like that. It's not because I'm too good for it. It's the fact of the matter is, is that it'd be an insult to pay me minimum wage. I wouldn't pay, well, some of you I wouldn't pay minimum wage. wouldn't pay that much. Uh, <laughs> some of you I would pay less than, uh, you know, whatever amount. In other words, I remember being in, in seminary and having a guy try to hire me and my time was much more valuable uh, than the wage that I could be paid. And so I remember helping a guy do something and he tried to pay me 10 bucks an hour. So you can keep your lousy 10 bucks an hour. It's not because I don't value a dollar. I do. I, I squeeze more out of a penny than anybody I know probably. But the fact of the matter is I did it as a friend to help him. I didn't do it to be paid $10 an hour. Uh, Dr. Jim Shetler, I remember, told a story about a woman that he was trying to share the gospel to. And uh, she was Italian, I believe, as, as the story goes. And she believed in good works for salvation. So she believed that her works would uh, earn her salvation. And he got invited to a meal, and she did a real Italian dinner. How many of y'all have been to a real Italian dinner? Any real Italians here? It's at least five courses, right? You have the first one, you think dinner's over, and then they serve the second one, and you're like, oh, wow, that's good. And then the third one, and the fourth one, and the fifth one, and then they start bringing the desserts and courses and all that. And I mean, it's, it's real. Uh, I, I love an Italian dinner. And if you are a lady and you prepare an Italian dinner, it's not, you know, let me, uh, let me, you know, let me uh, throw something together real quick sort of a thing. It's a matter of the person who is serving an Italian dinner gets up in the morning and begins the different things, and then while everyone's eating, they're serving. You know, because they're still preparing other things and they want to come off just right at the same time. And I'll tell you what, you just, you know, I'd be 500 pounds if I ate an Italian dinner once a month. Probably, I mean, it's for real. And uh, anyway, this lady prepared a special dinner for Dr. Shetler. And at the end of the dinner, Pastor Shetler did something, because he's trying to, sh trying to help her understand a truth, a principle. At the end of the dinner, and I, you know, I mean, it's, it's not my story, so I can't tell as well, but I'm not going to make up my own. Uh, but at the end of the dinner, I think it was that he said, thank you so much, this dinner was fabulous. And he pulled out a $20 bill and tried to give her 20 bucks for feeding, I think, him and his family. What do you think it cost financially to serve a five-course dinner? It wasn't 20 bucks, I promise you. Right? Okay. And it really offended her. And he intended to be offensive about it. And uh, she said, I did this for you. I did this because I wanted to do something for you. And now you try to give me $20. You know, and she was really offended. And then he used that as an illustration to help her to understand that she had the priceless blood of Jesus Christ, God's perfect Son, shed on the cross for her. And she thought that her good works were good enough. And uh, she got, I believe the lady got saved as, as the story goes. It helped her to finally understand what her works were. Our works of righteousness are as filthy rags to God. Do you think for a minute that Paul was stoned? 
that he uh, was shipwrecked, that he was robbed, that he was beaten, left for dead time and again for a paycheck? You know, it's, it's worth that 10 bucks an hour. You know, I, they're going to try to kill me, but I mean, if I get 10 bucks, <laughs> right? You think that's what his motivation was? And for somebody to cheapen his ministry by saying he's doing it for the money, the shame, the, the, the angst, the hatred that he endured from his countrymen, the perils that he endured, the idea that any person would do that for a dollar is, is absolutely the most ridiculous thing in the world, and yet the church at Corinth is accusing him of, well, he's in it for the money. He's never gotten a penny from him, <laughs> but they think he's in it for some other reason. And here he's talking about working for a reward, ministering or serving for reward, and he said, I have used, I have the right, I deserve to, by rights, if I am ministering to you in spiritual things, I ought to read from you in carnal things. That's right. But I have not, I have not exercised my right. I haven't received the right that I have. Now, in other places, we know that Paul did. We also know that in some places, Paul supported the church himself. Instead of receiving from the church, he supported the church. I just have to say about that, Paul apologized to the church for doing that. He said, forgive me this wrong. I was not chargeable to you. And he said, it was wrong of me. In other words, he taught them a bad behavior. You know, one of the worst things you can do as a, as a parent or as a person who's discipling someone or a person who's raising or training somebody is to teach them to be users instead of givers. Man, I'll tell you, parents, one of the most important things you can teach your children is how to be generous how to be a giver instead of a taker. Takers never have enough. They never do. Givers always have more than they need. I'm just telling you, that's just a, there's just a Bible truth, there's a God-honored principle that givers always have and takers never have enough. And uh, it's important, you know, for a church, you know, a church is going to have lack if it won't take care of its obligations. So Paul is saying, though, for a purpose, for a reason, I didn't receive support. And so here he gives his reasons. In the second part of verse 15, he said, that it should be so done unto me, for it were better for me to die than that a man should make my glorying void. You say, Pastor, what does he mean by that? What he means is that he has a glory, and he's not talking about glory like that belongs to God, but a right to be glad for his achievements. He has accomplished something in Corinth. Literally, there are people who have eternal life in Corinth because God has used Paul. Now, is there anything in life more rewarding than to know you've made an impact in someone else's life? That you've impacted eternity? Is there anything better than that? Did Paul have a right to glory in it? We're not talking about bragging here. We're talking about an individual having something to be thrilled about. And he has said... In verse 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. He said, my motivation in preaching the gospel isn't simply so that I can get something. You know, if I grow the church, then it will support me. Is that what he's saying? No. He says, necessity is laid upon me. What's the necessity of preaching the gospel? It's a passion for the lost. It's a compassion and a passion to fulfill the work of God. In other words, if He's created, if He has created in Christ Jesus, if He's made in Christ Jesus a new creation, what's His purpose? Same as yours and mine. To preach the gospel. My friend, if you don't preach the gospel, you don't understand a simple truth, and that is that necessity is laid upon me. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. You know, preaching the gospel sorts out a lot of life problems, I've found. I've met individuals, they just got it deal things that they're dealing with or issues, matters in life. And you know, let me just tell you something practically and simply. Oftentimes, an unrelated solution to your problem is to get your eyes and your mind off of your problem and get your eyes and your mind on to the bigger plan. 
lot of times we're just we're looking at just just our little world. And we are not concerned about the fact that the world is full of lost and dying people who are perishing. And we think that the problem is, is that you know we, we don't have a sufficient paycheck or we don't know what we're going to do about this physical ailment or we don't know how we're going to uh, be able to come up with what we need for a project or whatever the thing is. But actually the world's problem is that people are dying and they're lost and they're perishing for eternity. If you get your eyes off of your problem and just look at the overall picture, and you'll see that every command that Jesus gave his disciples before he ascended to heaven after the cross was to go and preach the gospel. You know what I found out? I found out that if I don't have a solution to a problem over here, I can go over here and preach the gospel and this problem here sort itself out. There's just something about fulfilling your life purpose that sorts everything else out. You know what else I found out? I found out I've been upset and concerned and worried and bothered over things that actually don't amount to a hill of beans compared to the things that actually do matter. If your lost loved one dies and goes to hell, what else matters? If your friend perishes for eternity, what else matters? What's so big in your life in comparison with that? If your neighbor goes to hell, what else matters? And Paul here is saying, necessity is laid hold upon me. I'm not preaching the gospel so that I can make a living. This isn't a job that I'm working. I'm preaching the gospel because it's my purpose. It's my purpose. Okay, so that's the... Why is he not preaching the gospel? He's not preaching the gospel uh, for man. He's not preaching the gospel... The second thing we see in verse 17 is unwillingly. Look at verse 17. If I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, and I abuse that I abuse not my power in the gospel. <laughs> give me five bucks and I'll give you the gospel. Tony made a cartoon about Calvinism one time and he had a cartoon character going, give me five bucks and I'll give you the five points. You know, <laughs> because they've made the five points uh, the gospel and it's not the gospel, it's another gospel. Uh, it's a funny, funny thing. But the reality of it is I've never preached the gospel to anybody so I can get something for it. Jesus paid it all. He died on the cross for our sins and the sacrifice that He made was of incalculable inestimable value. A drop of the blood of the innocent Lamb of God is not something that you could levy a price against. You cannot estimate what its value is. And to preach the gospel for something. Let's preach the gospel and grow our church. This is why we preach the gospel. Preaching the gospel grow the church. There's a lot of facts of preaching the gospel. That isn't why we preach the gospel. We preach the gospel because necessity is laid upon us. Because a dispensation of the gospel has been committed unto us. And now Paul uh, is explaining that you cannot preach the gospel or he does not preach the gospel unwillingly. He does it because he desires to do so. I'm not doing it because I need to. I'm doing it because I want to. In verse 18, the second part, he said that I abuse not my power in the gospel. And here we come to the verse that we read in our text for the second time. And this is one of the things that if you're reading chapter 9 and verse 1, and you look at Paul's second question that we saw last week, am I not free? Did anybody, did anybody last week wonder when Paul said, am, not, am I not an apostle? We knew what he meant by that, right? He was asking if he were a legitimate apostle. We know what the qualifications for an apostle are. There are many people that call themselves apostles, but they're not. To be an apostle, you had to be an eyewitness of the Lord Jesus and His resurrection. You had to, you had to physically see the Lord, the resurrected Christ. To be an apostle, you had to be recognized by the other apostles. There are several qualifications for apostles we looked at last week. We understand why Paul was asking that question. He is asserting his authority or his right to teach this church at Corinth or to correct them about things that are wrong. And the reason he has the right to write him this letter and to demand of them that they correct things that are wrong in the church is because he is an apostle. But the second question that he asks is a little baffling, isn't it? 
Ever study that? Am I not free? Well, what are you talking about, Paul? Well, he's actually talking about his status, his class. You know, there were actually, uh, church history tells us that there were actually individuals who were slaves or servants and actually pastored in their own master's house. In other words, the person who technically owned them was their master. That's why there's some commandments like Serve, let as many as servants as are under the yoke. And it talks about how they're supposed to give honor and treat uh, the way they're supposed to treat their masters, understanding that they don't have an earthly master, they have a, a God which is in heaven. And let every person who is a master understand that he doesn't have a servant. He serves God who's in heaven. We're all serving God. There's not, there aren't uh, caste, there aren't qualities in, in people with regard to God. There's neither bond nor free, neither Jew nor Greek, neither male nor female. And we're, all, they're all, we're all one in Jesus Christ. And, but Paul here is helping the believers to understand I'm not under orders by someone. Remember Onesimus, the runaway slave from Philemon and how that uh, Paul was sending him back to Philemon? Why was Onesimus being sent back to Philemon? Because he wasn't free. Paul told Philemon, he said, I'd like to keep him to minister to me, and I actually feel like I have the right to do that because you owe your own self to me besides. But Onesimus wasn't free. Paul was free. Paul also was a Roman citizen. So there wasn't someone that said, Paul, you're a believer, and I think you're naturally gifted toward it, so I'm just going to make you full-time gospel preacher. Well, got to do whatever the boss says. No, Paul said, I'm doing this of my own free will. I'm preaching the gospel because a dispensation is committed unto me. God's given me an opportunity. But I'm preaching the gospel because I want to. And isn't it so much better to do something because you want to than because you have to? Man, give me a want-to servant versus a have-to servant. Any day of the week, right? <laughs> I wish 95%, I'm throwing out the numbers made up, I wish 95% of the servants in the restaurants in South Florida would get fired. I wish they just fire most of them. I'm tired of going to a restaurant where I'm paying for someone to serve me and having them act like it, it's not my right to expect any kind of service at all. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, last week, there was a girl. She's, I think she was doing a pretty exceptional job considering, considering just the way it is. But Melissa and I were at Pollo Tropical last week. Walked up to a girl. She wouldn't look at me. And she finally, like, she stood sideways to me and then just listened for me to give her order, give, give the order. She could have said, hello, how are you? I said, how are you today? She wasn't going to say anything. She was not going to speak to me. And you really got the impression that she did not want to serve me at all. Not because I'd done anything to her. That's why she was treating everyone. She was a grudging servant. You could tell she was working for a paycheck, not for the Lord. You could tell she was working for a paycheck, not because she wanted her job. She didn't want to be there at all. And it was very, very evident. And so, you know, she just hits the cash register machine, waits for me to swipe my card. You know, does that, that kind of thing. I think it'd fire that girl. I would. Anthony? We'd be in trouble if we owned a restaurant, wouldn't we? We wouldn't be able to find anyone to work for us. Anthony always says, McDonald's would be the rest, best restaurant in the world if they just had better workers. they just fire the people. You know, so. <laughs> but the, the reality of it is, is that Paul is saying, I'm not working for anyone. There isn't anyone that's my boss. I'm working because I want to. And friend, if you and I want to understand how to have an eternal reward or how to work for a reward, we have to work. Do you hear me? We have to work because we want to. Because we understand. Paul said the second reason is because I'm a participant. Here are my goals for the, for the reward. First of all, what is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, verse 18, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. So my first goal is to preach a free gospel freely. Now it's kind of a messed up concept to take the free offer of eternal life and somehow make it chargeable to someone. To feel as though someone owes you something because you gave them the free gift. How many of y'all like the free gift? You know? 
free vacation. How many of y'all want the free vacation? <laughs> well, if it were free, now you now that you've come for the 90 hour thing that or 90 hour <laughs> the 90 minute thing, the 90 minute thing that turned into three hours. Here's your voucher, and to activate your voucher, you need to pay two hundred dollars. That's not free, right? Jesus died on the cross for unworthy sinners. Don't ever forget it. And there wasn't something that we could do to merit or to earn God's love, but God loved us. And salvation was offered as a 100% absolutely free gift. And for any person to put a charge on it, you know, it's one of the easiest ways to know that Catholicism is a cult. I'm not bashing or picking this evening, but they charge for everything. You want God to hear a prayer, light a candle, give a dollar. You know, you want you want your pray for your loved one that's in, you know, somewhere, limbo, purgatory, something like that here, get paid, get by an indulgence. It's still today. You, you want to be you want to be forgiven, say these prayers. Do, 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 do something. In other words, they made the gospel chargeable. Our, our poor bus kids from the, the community that's primarily Mexican that we pick up our kids in, whenever the priest gets wind that we're picking those kids up and they're coming to church and VBS and so forth, he goes in and makes all the parents sign them up for confirmation classes and it costs them $100. It just terrifies them. They're just like, no, 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 Pastor, you know, because they're going to get billed by the Catholic Church for letting their kids come to VBS. Chargeable. Chargeable. You know, man, I'll tell you, I, I get the impression some gospel preachers, they're not preaching, they're not preaching a free gospel. It's a business. It's a lunch. Paul said, I don't want any part of that. I don't want to make a free gospel chargeable. You get that? Okay, so how to preach, how to uh, preach for a reward or how to minister or serve for a reward. Make sure you keep a free gospel free. And then he goes on to talk about volunteer service. Here's how he describes it. Verse 19, Though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Now Paul said, I'm serving not because I have to. <laughs> Melissa knows uh, what happened that one time. One time I went into an office where Melissa was working and a lady who was there saw that I had coffee. She said, where'd you get the coffee? And, I, and she said, can I have some? So I just went back to my office and made coffee and gave her coffee. And then I think the next day she told me she wanted coffee again. And I don't know who she thought I was or what she thought I was there for, but I think she thought I was, you know what I'm talking about, she, she thought I was there to make coffee for people. So I just made her coffee. A lot of times when I'm in the store, people think I work there. I don't know what it is about me that makes it look like I work there. But if I go to Home Depot or if I go... Uh, to a hardware store, if I go uh, to, to Office Depot or whatever, people come up, where is the whatever? I'll just go try to find it. I mean, it's not even worthwhile trying to explain to them. I don't work there. I just try to answer the question and help them, you know. And the reality is I don't have to go, I don't work here. Well, the fact of the matter is if I'm a servant, I can just serve because I want to serve, right? And if you serve people, there will be folks that expect you to serve. How many times people come and tell me that the bathroom needs cleaning? Well, guess who cleans the bathrooms? Not me. <laughs> Charlie, right? Now, Mrs. Price or Miss Angela, just different folks here need the bathroom clean. But the fact is, is we're not paying anyone to clean the bathrooms around here. Servants are cleaning the bathrooms, and they're doing it because they want to serve. I think Lee might be the guy who cleans the bathrooms. I'm not sure. Somebody does it. Uh, <laughs> the reality of it is, is it, but you can be like, hey, that needs to be done, and all of a sudden you're acting as though the person's obligated to do it instead of doing it because they choose to, right? I get asked for a show of hands tonight, probably all of us have cleaned the bathrooms. Why? For a paycheck? No. No, we do it for the Lord, as unto the Lord. And that's what Paul's trying to say. I'm, I, he says, I, I don't want to be charged with anyone. I don't, want to, uh, I don't want to make a free gospel something that I could gain. But he goes, I become a servant so that I might gain. Listen, you want to have gain? You want to have reward? Paul says, become a servant. Here's how he served the Jews. In verse 20, unto the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. What's he trying to gain? Souls. Jewish souls. Uh, in verse 21, lawless people, that is non-Jews. To them that are without law is without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them 
that are without law. In verse 22, he said, To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And what's the point of it? He's trying to keep a free gospel free so that he can gain souls. I mean, Paul, Paul's not working for a paycheck. He's working for an eternal reward. He's working for people. What is an eternal reward? I'll tell you, my friend, if you can win someone to the Lord Jesus Christ, that's eternal. It's just there's nothing more eternal than the soul of a man. In verse 23, he gives us his final purpose. He said, This I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. And then he just reminds everyone himself of the fact that he's giving out something that he gets something of as well. <laughs> when Lee and I were in college, there was a guy our freshman year and he was a friend of mine who used to go on a Bible club with us. He won a million dollars at a basketball game. He bought a bag of M&M's, and the, the promotion wasn't even out yet. M&M's, the M&M company, was going to do a promotion where if you got gray M&M's in your M&M bag, then you won a million dollars. Anyway, this guy, Jay, uh, was Jay Roman? That was his name, right, Jay Roman? Uh, he opened his bag and he had these gray M&M's. He's like, why are there gray M&M's in here? It was before they were changing all the colors of the M&M's. And they started reading about it. Turns out he won a million dollars. He really did. One million dollars. And uh, the M&M company wanted to make a big promotion out of it, so they gave him boxes of M&M's. So everywhere he went, he was the M&M guy. You know? I mean, we're in my truck. We'd go to the beach. And he's like... M&M's for everybody, you know, like the most popular people in the world. You know, the best thing about giving out M&M's is eating them. Like, I don't think I ever get tired of it. I can get sick eating M&M's, but then I'll eat them again after I'm done being sick. Like I said, I get tired of M&M's, you know. The best thing about free M&M's is getting free M&M's. I, I think the million dollars was good for him, too, but, <laughs> but the M&M's were cool, <laughs> you know. And the reality of it is, is that one of the best things about getting to preach the gospel is participating in being a recipient of it. In other words, we're not preaching something that, you know, is for someone else and we don't get any of, or something that you have to earn, you have to pay. It's something that's free for us and free for others. And Paul said, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm a participant in what I'm preaching. It's a wonderful truth. Now, let's, let's finish up. So he, then he talks about um, you know, uh, running for the participation trophy. Verse 25. I love this. Uh, let's start with 24. Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. Now, <laughs> sorry to say, uh, Paul here is saying that the only person, the only other person who wins the race gets the prize. You don't get a trophy for participation. But verse 25 is the participation verse. He says, Everyone that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, the notion of being temperate in all things is that a guy that's trying to win the race has got to do more than one thing to win the race. Some people are naturally fast. You ever met somebody? I mean, they're just fast. Sometimes teenagers, they go from being like this awkward kid to like fleet of foot. It's just amazing. I, some kids, you just you just think they're, and you just say, wow, that kid is ridiculously athletic, and they just really haven't done anything to be athletic. They just are. You take your athletic kid, and I'll take my hard-working, disciplined kid, and we'll run a race, and my hard-working, disciplined kid will beat the athletic kid in just about any kind of a race. Now, a kid might just be naturally fast, and he can run from here to the wall, but if it's any kind of an endurance to it at all, a guy who trains is going to win. That's all there is to it. And when you train, you got to, to be temperate in all things. You, you literally have to temper or control all things. A guy that's serious about winning a race is going to be serious about the things that he eats. He's going to be serious about his exercise. He's going to be serious about his sleep. And he's going to be serious about how much of each he does. What's well, a really good protein? I'm going to eat a gallon. No, eat a little bit as you need it. Don't just chow down one time. Well, I'm going to go out today, and I mean I'm going to run until I drop. 
No, you train. You'll hurt yourself by running too much. You know, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, you know, whatever. You know, you have to be temperate, right? You have to be balanced. And Paul says a person who's serious about winning a race is temperate in all things. You you can't have uh, legitimacy in preaching the gospel and then have an area of your life where you don't have a good testimony. Here he's talking about your testimony. He's talking about preparing to run the race. If you want to be effective in preaching the gospel, you can't just take off one day and try real hard and expect to have any good results or to uh, ultimately win the reward. If you want to win the race, you have to prepare and you have to be prepared in everything that you do. You don't stay up late at night. You get in a regiment. And a regiment, you get yourself uh, disciplined about what you eat, what you do, all those things. Paul here is, is talking about being sobriety and temperance and preparing for the race. Now, this is taking quite a bit longer for a simple message than it should have. So let's rattle off a couple more things and then we will uh, be finished. Uh, Paul said, now a person running a race is doing it to obtain a corruptible crown. He said, but we are doing it to obtain an incorruptible crown. Now let me help you with something. We're not running against each other. We're not running against each other. Our competition isn't your peers here. We're running in a race together. And, and I love the word we here that Paul uses. It's an inclusive race. And so I liken this in many ways to a relay. To a relay race. Not because, you know, each of us is running a leg and while the others aren't participating, but because when, some, when souls are saved, when the ministry is accomplished, when the dispensation of the gospel is more than just committed to us, but is given out to people, we win. We've accomplished our purpose. And Paul said, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. He said, I'm not shadow boxing. I'm not running like, you know, this way and that way and this fast and that fast. He said, I set a pace, I set a direction, and I go. When I'm fighting, I'm not, you know, just, you know, just randomly striking out at different things. He said, I'm not as one that beateth the air. I know, I, when I fight, I know what, my, what I'm fighting. I have purpose. And he said, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that it, by any means when I've preached to others, boy, this is a scary verse to me. When I've preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul said one of the greatest tragedies would be if I show someone else the way and I don't make the way myself. This is how you succeed in running the race. This is how you succeed in winning the reward. And it would be too bad if Pastor Price told you how to do it and then Pastor Price didn't do it himself. Why? Not just because of the hypocrisy of it, but because of the missed opportunity of it. And Paul said, man, I'm taking this matter seriously. And I don't want my reward to be undermined by anything. Whether it be by being chargeable to a person and losing my freedom to do something because I want to instead of having to. Or whether it be because, because of, of getting off and, and uh, missing my purpose or uh, because of Serving because I have to serve someone versus, or because I want something from them versus serving because I'm a participant. He said, I'm, I'm going for a reward. And every person that strives for a mastery is temperate. Hey, listen, friend, if you're going to be effective for the cause of the gospel, there are things that you're going to have to cut. And there are things that you're going to have to add in your life. You're going to have to cut some garbage and you're going to have to add some good stuff in order to be effective in striving for it. And I find this to be very effective. Now, we could go down a list, couldn't we? And we could fill out the things that need to be cut, the things we need to be added, and all those things. But probably the list is more individual. Some people might need to gain a little bit. Some people might need to lose a little bit. Some people might need to whatever in order to be able to run the race. But we're running a race for an eternal reward, and uh, this is how to win the reward. Father, thank you for the practical message this evening. I pray that we'd be encouraged. You'd help us to tonight to leave this place asking very, very good questions, evaluating our lives and asking, what am I doing in order to win the race? Lord, we want to receive a reward. We don't want to just 
randomly run through life and hope that in the end that we're successful. There's no way in the world a person could be successful that way. And I pray that you would help us to see the seriousness of it and uh, the responsibility of it and to act accordingly. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take some prayer requests uh, this evening, if you will, please. Any prayer requests? <laughs>